Welcome to the Painting Lines Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things tennis. Join Eric and Aiden in their discussion for updates on news and pop culture, and from hot takes to betting, they've got you covered. Ready? Play. Welcome back to Painting Lines. Last week, we covered the second half of the Australian Open, and this week we'll be starting a best on tour series where we pick a few categories and then say which players we think are the best in their respective categories. So Aiden, why don't you tell us the categories today and kind of what we'll be touching on? Yeah, so uh, today we're kind of just going to be going through the basic two shots. We're going to be talking about forehand, backhand, and then the end we'll maybe throw in a little bit of a crazy one talk about people with the best drop shots on tour Ooh. so uh yeah you want to just start us off here with best forehand eric all right best forehand so for me i'm going with sinner rublev and root so i picked these guys just basically because of their raw forehand power um you know their heavy ground strokes and the ability to put it past you um you know another reason why i picked these players because i feel like the forehands are their best qualities so when you think of a player like Rublev or Sinner, you think fast, hard forehand. And someone like Rude, you think like heavy baseline forehand. So, you know, these three players, the first three that kind of come to mind for me. And for Rude and Rublev, I think it is their strongest shot, but I do think it's also their Achilles heel. So for example, Rublev tends to make a lot of airs on his forehand and Rude doesn't really trust his backhand too much. Like he will run around his backhand to hit his forehand and then leave the rest of the court exposed. So those are my three guys. Aiden, who are you going with? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, Rude definitely has that big inside out that he goes for a lot of the time, even when it's not necessarily <laughs> the best option for him. But yeah, I, I completely agreed on two out of those three, Rublev and Sinner. I mean... If you're talking about guys that just pound the ball from the baseline with that forehand, I feel like you have to have them on this list as some of the top guys on tour. And I think a big reason for me was if you're looking at guys that you would not want to be in a forehand rally with, you're looking at Rublev and Sinner. Like, I'm going to avoid their forehand. There are other guys that maybe have a great control on their forehand, but the way they would beat Rublev and Sinner would be to try to force them to hit other shots outside of their forehand. If they were trying to beat them in a just purely forehand rally, wouldn't go too well for them. <laughs> and then my last guy, I'm going with Alcaraz. I think he has a spectacular shot variety for all of his shots, but I think on his forehand especially, he has just the ability to transition from really great spinny shots from deep behind the baseline. And then in the next shot, he can be hitting a winner just uh, out of nowhere that I think that variety is really what makes his forehand one of his best attributes. Yeah, he's super athletic. So it's awesome when you get to see him like run after a forehand and kind of instead of just slicing it back or uh, stabbing at it, like he'll get a full whack, you know, he'll slap it right back. But um, it's pretty crazy how Sinner had one of the fastest forehands on tour like a couple years ago when he was super yeah. young. He's young right now, but even younger and not as developed. So it's kind of scary to think about once he like fully grows into his body. Yeah, and I think one aspect of that is that we're actually seeing, I think, Sinner maybe take a little bit off of his forehand. Because maybe a couple years ago, to me, it almost reminds me of the idea of a rattlesnake bite. Have you ever heard that thing about baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous because they don't control how much venom they put into their, their bites? That's mm -hmm. kind of how I, I think of Sinner earlier on. He was hitting the ball so hard on his forehand, but that was maybe... a creating more and more errors from him and he wasn't controlling it as much and now we're seeing center go hey i don't have to hit a winner on my forehand every time but i can force a bunch of errors out of my opponent while not taking as much out of me in terms of energy and so now we're seeing this more controlled version of his forehand that's still incredibly effective yeah exactly it's the perfect balance of keeping their opponent back on their toes by hitting so heavy and then just kind of switching it up when you need to not always going for the winner right off the bat just constant pressure yeah and i mean i think that's maybe somewhere that uh, rublev needs to work on a little bit it seems like he still kind of goes all out on every forehand <laughs> yeah i know i know oh man that's a fun group of guys though right there uh rublev and center yeah and i think the 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 forehand is maybe one of the most exciting aspects of the game to watch. Like you see a guy with a great forehand, you're like at any moment, this guy could just rip the ball and just end the point. Yeah. 
All right. Well, that's the forehand. Should we uh, transition into backhand? Yeah. And I think the backhand is interesting because I feel like usually it's much less of a outright power shot and it's more much more control based how well someone is able to hit their backhand because you don't really see that many guys just overpowering their opponent with a backhand but mm -hmm. you can control a point with your backhand by just moving your opponent around the court taking pace off the ball uh injecting a little bit of pace when it's unexpected and i think it's much more of a versatile shot almost right right i know and sometimes players will like revert to it when they're not feeling you know when they have the yips or their forehands just not on, you kind of, like you said, it's old reliable. It's something you have in your arsenal you can just roll with. Yeah, put two hands on the racket, feel safe <laughs> with it. Unless obviously you have a one-handed backhand, in which case oh, you yeah, just... Oh yeah, let loose. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, so I'm going Djokovic, Medvedev, and had to throw in a one-hander here with Dominic Team. Mm. I know, kind of, kind of an interesting group. But Djokovic, I obviously he comes to mind because I think he has the best ability to kind of switch to the offensive like you were saying it's more of a defensive shot but you see Djokovic he's really offensive with that backhand like he'll get in the backhand rallies and he won't hesitate to pull the trigger to just go down the line when uh, they've been exchanging cross court and I threw Medvedev on there because I feel like he just doesn't miss like that guy is so consistent with his backhand it's nothing special and quite frankly it looks pretty ugly too but it just works and um little funny story about him so you know how they do all those kind of stuff in between the matches for the atp finals you know stuff for social media where they'll make videos and hold up signs whatever they're asking questions so everyone in the group had to vote on one player and they all had to agree before they moved on to the next and the one of the questions was who has the most consistent backhand or who has the best backhand and everyone went with medvedev on that so I thought that was pretty interesting. He even voted best backhand by his cohort. And then the last one here, team. Uh, so like I said, I had to throw the one-handed in there. He He's an interesting guy. I do think Vavrinka had a better backhand, one-handed backhand back in the day. And obviously Feder vote uh, one-handed backhand. But we're talking about players currently on tour now. And while Vavrinka is still on tour, I think his backhand has regressed a bit where his team is still you know fairly young and has that energetic swing to him so putting it on there he's just explosive if you go and watch dominic team backhand winners it's like jaw dropping so that those are my guys who are you taking for the back end yeah i mean for me my only problem with team is that like in the last couple of years he's kind of fallen off if we were going a little bit like maybe one or two years ago i i might be uh, more inclined to say team on my top three but mm -hmm. you could argue that it's other aspects of his game that are letting him down more than just his backhand. Yeah, no, I, I know. For my uh, top three, I, I had to agree with you on two of them, Djokovic and Medvedev. I mean, I think there's really no doubt that Djokovic and Medvedev are on here because Djokovic may have one of the best backhands of all time. Just he has such an ability to, to take his backhand aggressively and even take it aggressively from difficult positions like it's that classic shot you see from Djokovic all the time that full stretch and somehow he's able to hit a passing shot up the line or sneak one cross court that you're like how did he just do that and I think that's something you don't see from a lot of guys then Medvedev I think Medvedev's backhand kind of fits perfectly into how unorthodox his game is because he plays so deep as we've talked about in many episodes, he plays so deep on the court and it sometimes feels like he's almost just waiting for the ball to come to his backhand and he's just picking out where he's gonna pinpoint that ball on the court. And then he puts it exactly where he wants to. He has great control over it. For my last guy, I went with Zverev for his backhand. I think Zverev has a very, a very clean motion on his backhand. And I think he has a great ability to not just be aggressive with it but actually set up points with his backhand a lot of guys i think they tend to use their backhand as just kind of a, a placeholder shot where if they're not super confident in it they will hit their backhand cross court wait for a forehand and then try to take control of the point zverev gets a backhand and all of a sudden he's controlling the point from that side of the court and i think that's something a lot of guys aren't able to do effectively yeah, and I think he gets so much power on that because his is so closed off, his backhand. Like, you see his right foot so much more in front of his left that he just kind of gets that oblique torque in there. But um, one thing I wanted to mention just on Medvedev, I don't know if you've seen a slow-motion video of him changing his grip from forehand to backhand, 
but it's so interesting because a lot of the players will take when they're changing to their backhand grip from forehand will put the left hand on the racket first and then adjust the right hand the bottom hand whereas he spins it in his right hand first and then puts his left hand on it's crazy to watch i highly recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it it's it's the most medvedev thing ever right yeah i, I feel like that's such a risk to try to do because oh yeah. you have to have such control over like the timing on that if you do it slightly too much all of a sudden you're just going to top that ball into the ground i know i know and then um just touching on Djokovic again watching slow motion videos of him hit his backhand from the side angle is just like his whole body's in that whole chain you know where like it starts with his his legs and then he just kind of moves forward with the shoulders. It's just like that therapeutic, like it's almost like a swinging, just whoop, whoop, yeah. back and forth. I, another thing about Djokovic is like growing up playing tennis, every coach is like, watch Djokovic's backhand. That's how I want you to hit it. Because his mm -hmm. form is, like you were saying, just so perfect and it's just so smooth and that's exactly the perfect form of how to hit a backhand, and that's why it's so effective. Dude, so smooth. It almost, he makes it look effortless, doesn't it? 100%. 100%. Yeah, whereas like when I hit my backhand, I'm like putting out the most power, trying to exert everything. It's like, no, just take it easy. Like use every other muscle in your body but your arms and just let your arms follow. Let them swing through. Exactly. It's like the opposite of Medvedev where it kind of makes sense that he would have that weird adjustment for his racket because – I feel like mm -hmm. Medvedev is the type of guy that will adjust his body motion to compensate for how his racket grip is rather than <laughs> adjusting his grip to compensate yeah. for how his motion is. Oh, for sure. For sure. So I guess we didn't really incorporate this, but I guess for next time, backhand slice should be on there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll kind of get into it a little bit with this this next one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's because true. Because um, if we're talking about best drop shot, that backhand slice can be a, a pretty a pretty effective way to hit that. Yeah. So who you, who do you have for your best drop shot? So for my best drop shot, I had to go with Alcaraz, Rude, and Morojan. I mean, Alcaraz right now is it's kind of no doubt he's the king of the drop shot on tour. Like you see him, him hit that drop shot way more often, and I think it's because it's very effective when he hits it. He'll sneak that drop shot in there out of nowhere. And even if it's not a clean winner, he sets himself up to win the point a lot of the time. Rude, I had him in there kind of as just like a sneaky guy where I feel like he has such a, a good baseline game where he spins, spins the ball deep and he can push a guy deep onto the court. And then all of a sudden he'll come in with a slice that's that can be really effective, especially because it's often unexpected in the point. And then my last guy, the Hungarian headhunter, Fabian Morozan. I mean, arguably, he could have the best drop shot on tour. We just don't see it as much because, obviously, he's not at the same level overall as a Rude or an Alcaraz. But in those times when we see him come up against top guys, I mean, he played the last two guys I just talked about, Rude and Alcaraz, with, and had massive upsets against them uh, last year. And in both of those matches, that drop shot he has was completely on display. He uses it incredibly effectively out of nowhere from the baseline and just hits crazy clean winners. Man, what a dark horse. <laughs> Merosian. Good stuff. Digging deep there. He's not someone that comes to mind, but I, I see what you're saying. For me, yeah, I also went Alcaraz. And I, like you said, I think he's got the best drop shot on tour. And I think especially his forehand drop shot too like that's a that's a tougher one that a lot of player players struggle with but he hits it so well and he even has the capability that players know that he's uh very dangerous with the drop shot so sometimes he'll set up for the drop shot and then hit that fake drop shot where you kind of like push it long you've you've seen mm. curious do it before yeah it's like almost show him show him the drop shot grip and then like cut it long i think also outcries is really effective at hitting a drop shot almost without changing his grip. He yeah. can stay almost in a regular forehand topspin grip and then somehow adjust his body and, and rotate his hips and rotate his arm so that he's still able to slice that ball. Yeah, it's beautiful how he like finishes up too. It's great. And then just kind of follows it in. Uh, next next guy I have on here is Bublik. Uh, dude, Bublik's kind of, he just does it so much. I think that's why he's so good at it because he is always doing it. And I think that, keeps the opponents on edge because 
he's able to take a lot of points away. And even if he doesn't win a clean winner on the drop shot, he's so hard to get past because he's so long. You know, he's a tall guy. He's hard to lob. He's got a nice smash. He covers the court very well laterally. So even if it's not the prettiest drop shot, he uses it to his advantage to just set up points. Um, kind of going off that third guy, Djokovic. Um, I feel like this is kind of a cop out here. <laughs> just take the best player in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, Djokovic, I feel like, is com almost the opposite of Bublik in how he uses the drop shot because Bublik, it's not even really a mix-up because Bublik's game is so all over the place. You you don't know what to expect from Bublik. You're like, okay, uh, he might go for a drop shot here. He might go for like a slice long. He might go for a topspin shot. I have no idea. Yeah. With Djokovic, his game is so solid. You're like, okay, I expect, okay, he's going to slice this one deep. Okay, he's going he's gonna to make almost the right decision every time. And sometimes the slice doesn't seem like the right decision and that makes it the right decision. Mm -hmm. So Djokovic, it's much more of a, a mix up for him because he's like, I'm going to hit a topspin shot, a topspin shot, a topspin shot, and then a slice. Bublik is like, I'm going to slice it and then I'm going to like hit a moon ball and then I'm going to do all this weird stuff. Yeah. And so you're like, you're almost more on your toes, whereas Djokovic can kind of lull you into a sort of rhythm and then hit the mix up slice. Yeah, I like what you're saying there because another thing I just kind of realized, Djokovic has the guts to hit a drop shot on when he's down, I don't know, on like set point. Mm. Um, if, if he's about to get broken, like positions where it's a high risk, high reward shot and he's willing to take those chances because not a lot of players are, you know, willing to risk hitting a bad drop shot on, when they're down a break or, you know, have a game point and then have the other player just run up and smash it on them. Like Djokovic just isn't afraid to do it. I mean, I think that comes down to just like the Djokovic mindset. I mean, mm -hmm. speaking on going for your shots, it, it, one of the biggest times that I always thought about Djokovic would have had like a pretty much guaranteed Grand Slam was in that 2020 US Open. I remember watching that final set between Zverev and team and watching these two guys that clearly just were trying not to miss their shots. <laughs> and I was like, Djokovic would take this match so easily at this point because you know that Djokovic would be going for shots still, even in the fifth set in a tie break. He's willing to go for that drop shot, even if it, it feels like a stressful situation a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. Drop shots are so fun to watch, man. Like, it's so pretty when a player just gets a nice slice under it and it's high. You can tell how many times that ball's spinning. So, like, right when it hits the ground, it's either going on the other side of the net or to the side. It's such yeah. a fun aspect of the game. Especially when they can do it from the baseline really effectively because oh, I know. then the uh, their opponent has to just see that happen and they're just sprinting full speed and they still can't get there. It's crazy. Yeah. I feel like Monfi is a guy that'll like do it and then he'll like do it so casually. He'll hit it and then just kind of like look at the crowd and walk because he knows he already won the point. Yeah, you know? it's, it's like the, the Curry uh, three when he like turns Exa away and exactly. looks, looks at the bench or something. Exactly. Dude, have you seen the uh, Benoit pair? Oh, he, of course. That's yeah. like the classic slice oh, clip where he's sliding and he almost hits his face on the ball. Dude, it's in front of his face. Yeah, he hits time. it like straight up almost and it just slides and he's like, oh, oh, and then it just <laughs> right back into the it's net. It's like one of those things, yeah, you got to like blow it away from you or something. Exactly, exactly. Uh, All right, are you ready to uh, hop into segments? Yeah, let's do it, man. Uh, let's see here. So I saw a pretty interesting article in the Herald. Um, so it was saying that the Australian Open boss, Craig Tiley, calls for major changes to tennis. So obviously this caught my attention. And um, once I started reading, though, his major changes were speed up the sport, uh, make it more attractive to young fans and pay players more. And, you know, he's quoted in the article saying that the power brokers of tennis need to shake its traditions I think it was all kind of just a bunch of hearsay. You know, I was looking for actual change, but he's just saying this. He didn't really come up with any implementation or how they were going to do this. Um, you know, even when asked, oh, well, if you want to make, if you want to speed it up, men play out of five sets, why don't you shorten that? And he's like, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. That's, that's, <laughs> it takes away all the drama and excitement from the sport. So to me, he's just kind of, yeah, talking out of his ass essentially. But it kind of made me realize the UTS, um, you've heard of that tour, right? Ultimate Tennis Showdown. Ultimate Tennis Showdown. They kind of already do that, man. Like 
It's weird. I personally don't really like it, but the matches are four quarters of eight minutes. It's first to win three quarters. Um, only first serves, no second serves. No more than 15 seconds between points. Um, there's like weird bonuses where, oh, the next point counts for three or you can take away a player's serve and then there's sudden death. And then the last one, I I kind of like this part are the nicknames. Like Casper mm. Root is the Iceman, Runa is the Viking, Sheldon is the Mountain, Medvedev is like the chess, the chess player, so <laughs> chess master. Yeah, I I think that uh, with the whole we need to make these changes, it probably was a situation where he was probably pressured to say that. That'd be my guess at least. Is yeah. people are like, you got to make changes, and he's like, I agree, we have to make changes, but he doesn't really want to do anything. The, and and I don't think there's really anything that can be done other than like what the UTS is doing but the UTS isn't as popular as the ATB tour for a reason it's because tennis fans like how tennis goes right now mm -hmm. the issue is that with the constant uh, desire for growth it's hard to draw people into tennis that aren't tennis fans already I think that's how it is for a lot of sports though you don't see a lot of people that aren't basketball fans sitting down to watch a full basketball game unless it's the NBA Finals, but I think that's already a situation with tennis where if it's the Wimbledon Finals, some of it isn't a tennis fan will watch it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think there's only one solution here. I think Taylor Swift needs to date Carlos Alcaraz. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll attract a, yeah. about, I don't know, quarter of a billion people worldwide. It's crazy to me that people people care that much about the artist that they all of a sudden will well, she watch has a this cult. Sport. Yeah, she has a legit cult following too. Yeah, it's insane. She's definitely like the biggest artist in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and then uh, what I saw this week was obviously the tournament in Montpellier. Bublik was uh, the comeback kid. Uh, there was a whole article about how he won this whole tournament and was the first guy in ATP Tour history to win the tournament and have lost the first set in every single match he played. And to me, it's just classic Bublik, just taking the most unorthodox route to the win and getting it done, but not necessarily getting it done in a uh, pretty fashion. Yeah, I feel like he's a troll. Like he just trolls the ATP. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm just gonna uh, get in my opponent's head by giving them all a, first, a all one set lead. Yeah, well, hey, we should start uh, maybe betting over two and a half sets for, for yeah. all the Bublik matches. Well, now he's just going to go only under just yeah, because exactly. he set the expectation to be over two and a half exactly. sets. Well, speaking of betting, who are you taking this week for bet of the week? Uh, I'm going with I'm going with the uh, the old dog, Murray. Oh, I'm going sir. With Murray plus 180 over Mahak. <laughs> Murray has lost his last five matches, but like when you look at those matches – he only has one bad loss, which was to Benoit Paire. And I think Murray's going to come out angry in this match. After all the negative stuff that's been said about him online, he's too old, he's tarnishing his legacy. I think he's going to come out and he's going to beat this guy who I think really shouldn't be the favorite. I think Murray should be the favorite. It, to me, the reason that Murray isn't the favorite is because of that streak of losses. But like I said, he lost to like only top 20 guys. Like nobody really that unexpected to beat him so i think this is a good bet yeah plus 180 is crazy for murray i'm, I'm gonna ride that one with you so i'm taking uh alexander kovacevic aka kova minus 105 over kepfer kova i like a lot he's a up-and-coming american he's kind of got a home-ish crowd home country crowd in dallas uh, he played well at the australian open he just broke into the top 100 after it um he played Hatchinoff pretty well, took him to four. It was tighter than what the the overall match kind of looked like, but still, he's coming in with momentum. Kepfer was minus 120, Kova's minus 105, so taking Kova here, and I'm feeling pretty confident about it. Solid. Yeah, I think it's a pretty yeah. reasonable bet. I mean, I like the momentum picks always. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. taking a momentum pick, obviously, this week, but <laughs> I, uh, I, like, I like going for that a lot of the time because... I think tennis is such a mental game that having good momentum going into a match can be massive. Uh, what about match of the week? What'd you go for? Dude, match of the week. I took FAA, our boy. He uh, he down our my other boy, Kazo, uh, 752676. So Kazo was coming off a hot Australian Open, uh, made it to the fourth round, had a big upset against Runa. 
So the match was pretty tight the first set. Um, Kazo kind of took control of the second set, though, 6 2. And then at this point, I thought he would just kind of run away with the match because usually once you win the second set that big and he was in front of his French crowd, I just thought he was going to take it home. But then third set, FA had a match point and he couldn't close it out. Uh, but he did get it done in the tiebreaker. And even though the ranking differential was pretty high in this, I do think this is a big win for FA because he hasn't had the best last few months. And I think this is a good moment for him to kind of overcome this adversity against Kazo, who's a good player playing in front of a French crowd and not close it out on a match point, but still get the job done. Yeah, I think it's definitely a positive for FAA too, just being able mm -hmm. to string a couple of wins together in this tournament, because obviously that was something that he really struggled to do last year. And I think we are seeing a little bit of uh, Montpellier was inside. So he does get that aspect being a, a positive for him, because obviously he is uh, an indoor type of player, but mm -hmm. still positive for him to to get a couple wins here. Yeah, what about your match of the week? Yeah, so my match was uh, Bublik beating Shapovalov. Uh, it was Bublik's first match after kind of a tough first round exit in, in the Australian Open. And he came here and kind of got dominated in that first set against Shapovalov. I think it was 6-1. Then he kind of settled in. They battled back and forth in a really close second set. And Shapovalov actually had a match point at 6-5 in that set. Didn't end up taking it. Goes to a tie break. Super close, back and forth, back and forth. Shepovalov has more match points, doesn't convert, and Bublik ends up uh, serving it out at 14-12 and uh, takes the tie break. Bublik then built off of that going into that third set while he had a mental advantage over Shepovalov after having a tough uh, loss for Shepovalov in that second set. And uh, he broke early in the third. Even though Shepovalov after that was able to kind of settle in in that third and didn't get broken again, he uh, he wasn't able to break Bublik back, and Bublik ended up taking the third 6-3. So really a tight match and really tense there, especially in that, obviously, that second set where Shapovalov had that match point. But in the end, uh, Bublik got it done and was able to then go on and win the tournament. So pretty pretty crazy run for him, given that he was that close to being eliminated. Man, my heart goes out to Shapo. That is tough. Yeah, but I think it's also a positive sign for him that he was able to be that close to beating the guy that ended up winning the tournament shows that his level is almost at the point where he could be winning these tournaments. Yeah. You think it, it goes to show his physical level is at that point, but his mentality just isn't quite there yet. Maybe. I mean, I think what happened was that he had these match points and Bublik just played great. I mean, especially or five serving six Bublik made a really aggressive play coming to the net and if Shepovalov had gotten a lucky shot, had maybe hit one slightly better, Bublik misses it, and all of a sudden Shepovalov is through. I think it's not necessarily a massive mental aspect. I think the big thing here is just that he didn't convert on the, those couple points that were crucial, and mm -hmm. that's how tennis goes. Is it can be a, a game of one or two points. Yeah. Well, kudos to Bublik for you know coming up to the net, taking that risk. Yeah. I feel like that's a that's big on his part. S switching it up with his unorthodox style. Uh huh. I find it so interesting when players find themselves in a jam and just go for the the riskiest you know moves they can. But yeah, hey, especially when it pays, pays off. off. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Because when it pays off, you're like, oh yeah, I'm the smartest guy ever. And then when it doesn't, you're like, everyone just kind of looking at you like, really? Like, that was so dumb. Why would you're you do down that? On match point. You're like Federer. Why did you rush the net? <laughs> I mean, you knew Djokovic could pass you. Oh man, dude. Yeah. Some people still won't get over that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I don't think Federer fans will ever be over that. But oh I know. I know. Well, I saw did you see the clip on 60 Minutes where the interviewer was interviewing Djokovic and he was like, So Novak, do you see you, Rafa, and Roger sitting down having dinner together? And he was like, No, not anytime soon. <laughs> We're actually not friends, you know. We're big competitors but i'd like to eventually i would really like to sit down with them it's just you know right now it's a little fresh the curtain hasn't quite closed yet yeah i think it's it like, takes wow. probably like 10 years post playing like once maybe uh -huh. the, these guys are like in their 50s they'll be like okay nothing's yeah. gonna change now i mean like nothing can be changed now but it still feels yeah. like 
like that loss is still fresh in Federer's mind even five years later later I think I think Djokovic will still be playing when he's 50 <laughs> yeah he's like no, I just yeah, got my celery juice and uh yeah. get my joints massaged <laughs> yeah oh what a guy all right and that's the show if you're not already subscribed go ahead and hit that subscribe button you can find us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube at Painting Lines Podcast. Feel free to shoot us a DM or email us any questions or thoughts at paintinglinespodcast at gmail.com.